Last week, I made a video about the global climate system, and to help explain some things, I used this map, which, besides being very colorful, shows the average temperatures across the world. And, well, when I first found this map, I immediately started looking it over for interesting details, and soon enough, a couple hours had gone by, because, you know, time flies when you're having fun. But during this time, I began to think about climate and how it might affect human behavior. Specifically, I started trying to figure out if there was one climate in particular that was optimal not only for the survival of humans, but for the construction of advanced human civilizations. Because this is the type of stuff I like to do in my free time. In short, what temperature, if any, supports human development the best? Before we get into it, real quick, I want to talk about human biology. Typically, our bodies prefer to keep an internal temperature of around 37 degrees Celsius, or nearly 99 degrees Fahrenheit. This is so that all the enzymes and such in our body don't denature and we can continue on, you know, functioning and living. So knowing this, you would expect the optimal temperature for humans to live in to also be around 37 degrees Celsius. But if you've ever actually experienced 37 degrees, you know that it's hot and miserable and nowhere near the ideal temperature for humans. In reality, the human body prefers an ambient temperature closer to 21 degrees Celsius or 70 degrees Fahrenheit. This way, all the excess heat created through our metabolism can be fully exhausted to our surroundings, without removing too much heat as to force our metabolisms to speed up in order to compensate. Basically, at this temperature, excess heat production equals heat lost to our surroundings, and therefore we neither gain or lose heat. Okay, so knowing this, let's take a look back at our map. First, I'd like to point out East Africa. It was here that modern humans first evolved and is therefore the natural environment we are all best adapted for. And we can see that the temperature here is pretty close to 21 degrees all around, which isn't a coincidence. Being comfortable with the average temperature in this region meant that our bodies had to spend less energy controlling our body's temperature, either by sweating or by shivering, so we could spend more of our energy on other activities like hunting or thinking. Therefore, when thinking about places that will encourage human development the most, it makes sense to suspect places that have a similar climate to that of East Africa would feature the most successful human civilizations. On this map, 21 degrees is represented by this lighter orange color, so if I color select for this and mute everything else, we can see where on Earth the average temperature is roughly in line with our biological optimum. Doing this, we can see that the nearby Sahara Desert actually fits inside our ideal range as well. This is likely the effect of having extremely hot days matched with near-freezing nighttime temperatures. Though I think the climate of this area is far too dry to have been ideal for any advanced civilization to emerge. Interestingly, if you do add water to a place like this, maybe in the form of a river, the story changes. And that is exactly what happened here, where the Nile River gave birth to the early civilization of Egypt. So with this temperature and a reliable source of water for drinking, and more importantly irrigation, a highly complex civilization was able to arise. The exact same is actually true further east as well, where we'll find the only complex civilization which predates Egypt, Mesopotamia. But again, most of this temperature is actually found further south in the Arabian Desert, while the part that was densely populated for the time relied on rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, to thrive. That being said, looking elsewhere isn't too promising. In South America, there's this central region on the border between Argentina and Paraguay where no real advanced civilization ever emerged. The same could be said for these small areas in North America where it occurs as well. Moving over to Europe, we can see it's entirely absent here. There are some small pockets in southern China as well as Southeast Asia, but these zones are actually just narrow gradient areas wedged between more dominant temperature zones. I'll return to them in a second. Lastly, this is also the average temperature across a lot of the Australian interior, which, much like the one in Africa and Arabia, occupies a large desert area, and as a result also never hosted a large, complex society. So, on the whole, despite being the human optimum, only two small areas within this average temperature ever really hosted substantial human civilizations, and I don't think it's a coincidence that these two happen to be the oldest ones ever recorded. So, I believe we'll need to keep looking if we want to find the best temperature for civilization. If we try looking at areas that are warmer, say between 25 to 30 degrees Celsius on average, we'll get a map that looks like this. From this, we can see that this is the temperature most often found around the equator, and included in this range are most tropical rainforest and warm deserts. And overall, neither of these environments are ideal for the development of large civilizations, which explains why none have really ever emerged in these areas. Also included in this temperature range, however, is tropical savanna, which is much better at accommodating humans. 
In particular, tropical savanna is the dominant environment across much of the Indian subcontinent. Here, we'll find the second, soon to be first, most populous country on the planet, and the cradle of several advanced civilizations. I think it's safe to say India is an anomaly in this way, with few other civilizations ever finding long-term prosperity within this higher temperature zone. And on the whole, this temperature typically creates some of the most challenging environments to human society. So, as expected, we'll have to look at other temperatures. Now, it was at this point in my search that I made a pretty obvious realization. Humans do work, and when we do work, our blood starts to flow and we get hotter. In order to build a large civilization, a lot of work has to be done. Farmers need to plow fields, soldiers need to march, people need to run errands, things need to get done. What I'm getting at is maybe a climate needs to be slightly colder than the human ideal to allow people to remain comfortable while working instead of while resting. After all, it's really the amount of work done by a civilization that determines how successful it is. Or at least, that's my hypothesis anyway. So if we look back to the map and look for temperatures slightly below 21 degrees, around 16 to 19 degrees, we'll get a map that looks like this. And this, I think, is where we'll find the answer to our question. Doing this, we can see seven distinct regions take form. One in North America, one in South America, another in Southern Africa, perhaps the largest surrounding the Mediterranean Sea, another one over the Middle East, one over Eastern China, and finally one in Southern Australia. And if we take a closer look at a couple of these, an interesting pattern emerges. The Mediterranean, for example, was the region that hosted, among others, the Roman Empire for hundreds to thousands of years. Interestingly, we can see the Roman Empire almost exclusively stuck within this temperature range, going as far north as England while leaving lands of differing average temperature unconquered despite them being much closer to the center of the empire. Looking at the African portion of Rome, it clearly straddles the northern coast, also where the temperature remained in line with that of the rest of the empire. Moving over to the Middle East, another huge center for human civilization, and what do you know, we come across another large expanse of our slightly below ideal temperature. Not to pick favorites, as a lot of important civilizations came out of this region as well, but perhaps the most well-known of them would be the Persian Empire. And once again, we can see that their borders roughly coincide with this narrow temperature range. What I find most interesting is the eastern border of this empire, where it virtually expands right until the temperatures change, making it deep into Central Asia and all the way to the Indus River, but stopping relatively precisely at the point where it either gets much hotter or much colder. Of course, other factors were also at play in deciding the shapes of both of these empires, and temperature was hardly ever the only reason an empire stopped expanding. Namely, resisting people groups like the Germanic tribes fighting the Romans or the Greeks fighting the Persians, accompanied by natural barriers like the Sahara Desert and the Himalaya Mountains, also would have prevented growth. Moving further east, we reach perhaps the most productive area in the world in terms of humanity, China. On this map, we can see that only the easternmost side of modern-day China is contained within this temperature range, which actually helps support this idea. You see, looking at a population density map of the country, we can see that eastern China is actually where the population is concentrated. That's why, if we look at any of the borders of ancient Chinese dynasties, this one is of the Qin Dynasty, we can again see this almost perfectly aligns with our selected temperature range, with only a little bit of the south spilling into warmer temperatures and a bit of the north spilling into colder areas. Clearly, we can see these three regions, which have been at the center of many prosperous human civilizations continuously for thousands of years, all have the same average temperature. But that doesn't mean they're the only centers of humanity, and recently a new seat of power in the world has arisen to challenge those previously mentioned. Today, the United States has arguably joined the ranks of one of the most powerful civilizations in history, and it just so happens to fall right atop another area with this 16 to 18 degree range. If we switch again to density, we can see that the population here is also concentrated within our given temperature range, similar to China's population. The country's most populous state, California, is almost entirely within this range, and same goes for its second most populous state, Texas. Then, taking a look at the country's least populous states, Wyoming and Vermont, we can see that they're both completely outside of this range. In the end, it would seem that many of the most powerful and influential civilizations, and even the most powerful states within a country from ancient history all the way to modern times have at least one thing in common, made clear by this map. Human civilization seems to reach a maximum whenever operating in a temperature range slightly colder than our biological optimum. Again, my theory for this is that it allows humans to work more comfortably, but I'd like to hear your theories as well, so let me know in the comments. 
However, looking at this map a little longer, we can see that these four areas we looked at aren't actually the only regions in the world that experience this temperature over a large area. There are in fact one, two, three additional large regions which feature the same average temperature. One in South America, roughly corresponding to what's called the Pampas region, shared between Argentina and Uruguay. Another one in Southern Africa, occupying what's today called the Kalahari Desert, reaching all the way from the country of South Africa all the way up to the bottom of the DR Congo. And then lastly, we have another one stretching across the lower half of Australia. So, once I got to this point, I was left with the question, why didn't these three regions ever host a similarly successful civilization? After this, I started doing more in-depth research, but I couldn't find anything focusing on these specific regions or these specific questions. But I have an education in environmental science and geography, so at the very least, I can try to figure this out on my own. Obviously, this is a complex question, and any answer I come up with will be an oversimplification. Also, I'm open to other ideas and opinions. That being said, I believe the biggest factor which restricted the formation of advanced civilizations in these areas to be isolation. Looking at these three remaining regions, each one of them hides behind several natural barriers and would have been difficult for people to reach in the past. The Pampas region of South America, for example, was tucked behind both the Amazon rainforest and the Andes Mountains. As migrating humans came in from the north, these likely provided too great of a barrier for significant populations to settle here, and therefore left the region largely underpopulated for most of history. Moving over to Australia, the same can be said, where early migrating humans would have had to cross tremendous obstacles to even find this area, let alone settle it. Above this is the Australian Outback, a mostly desert region. Preceding that is the ocean, another difficult boundary to cross. And what islands there were for people to make the journey on were covered in dense rainforests, providing three challenging barriers to the discovery and wide-scale settling of such an area. Lastly, we have the region in Africa that roughly corresponds to the Kalahari Desert. And that should be your first hint, as an ideal temperature isn't the only thing necessary for an ideal climate. Even the name Kalahari comes from the Tswana word, Kagaligadi? Which literally translates into a waterless place. Add on to that a shielding provided by the Congo rainforest and then the Sahara Desert, and this region was also very difficult to reach and settle for most of human history. Now, this theory of isolation helps, but I'm sure at least some of you have already come up with the next question. Both China and the United States are isolated as well, and yet they still manage to take advantage of their climate to become influential powers on the world stage. And this leads me to an important secondary contributing factor, population. Today, all of Europe has a combined population of around 740 million people, while the Middle East hosts around 410 million. Meanwhile, China alone today contains nearly 1.4 billion, more than both of the other two places combined. Of course, these proportions were a little different thousands of years ago, but for the most part, China has always had a massive population, one that was large enough to sustain technological advancements on its own without the need for cultural exchanges. Meanwhile, the Middle East and Europe, each one individually smaller than China, traditionally relied more on trading of different ideas and technologies between each other. I think the United States proves both of these points very well, as prior to 1500, populations here were relatively low and isolated. A worst case scenario, you might say. With no influx of new ideas and without enough people to truly drive its own advancement, the nations here stayed small and ununified. But after 1500, this isolation ended when transatlantic exchange with Europe became possible and once an influx of people through colonization and immigration occurred, another seat of power in the world was created. In short, once enough people with contact to the outside were in the right place, a stable unified state could form. Altogether, I believe this shows that the isolation of areas, people, and cultures most often leads to a failure to build a complex civilization, even if the natural conditions like temperature favored such a development. However, as our technology advances, isolation will become less and less of a problem, as the internet allows for the spreading of ideas and culture across the globe instantaneously. The effects this could have on civilization as a whole is still unknown, but I think given another couple hundred years, we might see the rise of several more 
substantial powers centered around these three regions. That's just a prediction on my part, however. And of course, history and civilization is more complex than just temperature. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, I'd hope you consider donating to my Patreon, as it really helps videos like these get made, and you could get your name in the video like all these generous people. Other than that, yeah, subscribe if you want to keep seeing my videos. I try to make one every week. Thanks.